Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, is this the Dynamo Motorcycle Company? Yes, it is. How can I help you? Well, I have an instruction manual here for your new electric motorcycle, but I'm not satisfied with the purchase at all. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but don't worry. I'm sure we can sort this out. Before we do anything, can you tell me the model number? Ah, at the top of the instruction manual here, it gives the model number R T Y three four. Uh, T Y three four. Okay. Now, what's the nature of your complaint? It's many things, actually. The biggest problem is that you say in your manual that the battery will take the motorcycle thirty kilometers. That's right. Well, it's lucky to take me eight. The battery is usually flat by then, often leaving me stuck at the side of the road. Are you sure you're charging it correctly? I'm fairly sure. I follow all the instructions and plug it in for a long time. And are you sure you charge it for the required three hours? I charge it until the charging light goes off, and that's two hours, so that should be enough. And there's a serious design fault with this motorcycle. When you're riding it, there's no meter to show you how much power is left, so you actually don't know when the machine is going to stop working. There's a voltage gauge. Yes, but that tells you nothing. The needle fluctuates about from fifty-five to forty-five, so whatever it says is meaningless. According to the manual, you're meant to charge the battery if the needle falls under fifty volts. But even when you charge it, it can go below forty-five. As I said, the needle just waves all over the place. The result is that I'm always worried that the bike will leave me stranded in the middle of nowhere. Well, I'm sorry about that. Sure, but what are you going to do about it? Unfortunately, we don't have a refund policy. But if you take the bike to one of our shops, our mechanics will look at it. Perhaps there's a problem that we can fix. The gauge, for example. The other problem is the battery. I actually weighed it, and it's almost six kilograms. Yet you say in your manual that it weighs only three. I can barely pick the thing up, so it's not three kilograms at all. Maybe you purchased the wrong model by mistake. I doubt that very much. Basically, I think I've been defrauded, and I'd like to know what you're going to do about it. All right, I'll put you through to our complaints department. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Hello. Complaints department here.、Uh, apparently, you have a complaint. Yes, I do. Let me tell you all about. It's it's all right. Our representative has already informed me about your problem. It's probably just a misunderstanding. I'm sure we can work something out. Right now, I need to take down some details. All right. Can I have your name, please? Jesse Parkinson. That's J E double S I E and Parkinson, P A R K I N S O N. Parkinson. All right. What shall we list this complaint under? Parts, service, or performance? Well, the meter isn't accurate at all, so that's parts, isn't it? Yes, perhaps, but you do feel more generally that the motorcycle doesn't meet the operational standards as advertised. So it's probably better to tick performance here. Can we tick both parts and performance? 
No, we can only tick one, so let's not call it parts. We'll go with performance. Now, we may post some further forms and questionnaires to you, so would you mind giving me your address? Certainly, it's 45 Melrose Road. Melrose, M-E-L and Rose. Okay, now, your phone number? Just use my mobile phone. That's 0928982453. Okay, and if we have any follow-up questions, what time is best for ringing you? Morning, afternoon, night time? Well, I work as a secretary from 9 to 5, but I do get a lunch break which gives me some free time. This break used to be 12.30 to 1.30, but then it changed to an hour later, so it's best to ring me at 2pm, since the break now starts at 1.30. All right. Uh, that's all for now. We just need to do our own investigation, and we'll probably ring you back tomorrow. I'm sure we can get to the bottom of this. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a lecture on art and culture in the Indonesian island of Bali. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Last week, we looked at the traditional art of Japan. In this week's lecture, we're going to move south and look at the very special way in which art has developed in the beautiful island of Bali, which is now part of Indonesia. I'll begin by giving you a brief historical overview. It's thought that the first inhabitants of Bali were farmers who arrived around 3000 BC, at the beginning of the Iron Age. They probably originally came from China, and in Bali they cultivated rice and built temples ornamented with wood and stone carvings and statues. The Hindu religion was introduced in the 14th century AD, and this has remained the main religion on the island. This was an important period in the artistic development of the island, when sculptors, poets, priests and painters worked together in the service of the ruling families. Rather than painting everyday scenes, artists concentrated on narrative paintings illustrating the epic stories of Hinduism. Bali's rich natural resources have always made it an alluring goal for merchants, and from the 17th century onwards, Dutch ships visited the island to trade in spices and luxury goods. Gradually, the old royal families lost their power, and eventually, in 1906, the Dutch East Indies Company was founded, and the island became a colony. In the 20th century, art then took on a very different role, as a tool accessible to everyone in the fight of the Balinese people against colonization, rather than as the property of a minority. Shortly after this, in the 1920s, stories of the beauty of the island of Bali began to spread around the world, and Balinese art underwent another vast transformation with the advent of tourism to the island. At first, this was only on a small scale, but it had important effects. Expatriate artists from Holland and Germany settled on the island, bringing paper, Chinese ink and other new materials with them. 
they worked with local artists, encouraging them to experiment with concepts like naturalism, expressionism, light and perspective, as well as to move away from the traditional focus on narrative painting towards something closer to their own experience. When independence came in 1945, this desire for an art to match a new national identity became stronger and the traditional narrative paintings started to give way to scenes showing the everyday life of the Balinese people, harvests, market scenes and daily tasks, as well as the myths and legends of their history. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Many of the features that give this art its special place in the world today can be traced back to these historical roots. One feature that is rooted in the events of the last century is that today in Bali, the production and the appreciation of art is not restricted to a minority. In fact, there is a famous saying that in Bali... Everyone is an artist. And it's not considered that to make art or talk about art, any formal training is needed. Art is just produced as part of Balinese life. Even fruit salad is served with flowers strewn on top. One factor which has contributed to this productivity is Bali's fertility. Over the centuries, the rich soil and the fact that food and shelter are readily available has given the islanders the leisure to develop their arts. While painting, sculpture, carving and music have traditionally been the province of men, women have channeled their creative energy into making lavish offerings to the gods with spectacular pyramids of flowers, fruit and cakes offered at the temples on festival days and celebrations. All these kinds of art still have close links with the religion of the people and are something that people do on a daily basis. Another special characteristic of art in Bali is that it is not generally seen as an individual pursuit. In the West, art is often carried out by the artist on his own, reflecting his own individual world view in the hope of achieving personal wealth and fame. For Balinese artists, art is something that's done as a group, and many artists may participate in one piece of work. And Balinese art is not restricted to temples and offerings. It decorates objects such as jackets, motorcycles, hotel menus, and so on. But perhaps the most significant characteristic of Balinese art, and one that distinguishes it most from the art of the West, is to do with its expected lifespan. Carvings are made in soft stone, which is gradually destroyed over the years. The humid climate rots paper and cloth paintings. The magnificent offerings of fruit and sweets are eaten. Wooden statues are destroyed by insects. But Balinese artists accept that their work is ephemeral, not permanent, and instead of slavishly preserving the originals, they produce new art. And all this rebuilding, renovating and replacing means that the island's art continually evolves and perpetuates itself. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student union officer's speech. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi there. May I wish you a very warm welcome to Ealing College, and more especially to the Student Union. The Student Union is run by four sabbatical officers, of which I am one. As the President, I am charged with the overall day-to-day -day running of the Union itself, according to established policies within the Constitution. We also have a brilliant staff team who will help us and you'll meet them when you have five minutes to drop in and see us. The last year has seen the student union grow from incorporating a bar and a few offices with a small shop into being a thriving concern which controls, to its credit, two bars, a cafe bar or restaurant, a shop, a comprehensive welfare department and numerous offices. All this has been achieved by sheer hard work and dedication on the part of last year's sabbatical team and staff, who overcame many obstacles and teething problems, but won through in the end. This year, our aims as a team will be to consolidate on what has already been achieved and to secure the future of the Union. With the new post of Vice President Social and Communications, our main emphasis will be on communications within the College which has always proved a problem in the past, but one which we hope to improve upon this year. One way will be the regular publication of a student union magazine, so all you budding journalists come on down. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We are very aware that a lot of you have never had any contact with student unions before and don't know what they are or what they can do for you. So basically, here's a quick rundown. If you have any problems at all, either when you start college or throughout your time here, don't hesitate to drop in in the SU office in the North Building and see Pat, our office assistant. She will be able to help you with most of your day-to-day -day general inquiries, or if she can't, she will direct you to one of our staff who can. Myself and the other three vice presidents are here every day, and if you need to see us, just fix a time with Pat, and we'll be only too happy to help you. By the way, queries or problems can range from a late grant check finding a place to live and academic matters, right through to the best places to eat, directions to the bar, or somebody blocking you in the car park. We'll give anything our best shot. Please remember, while you're at Ealing, that going to college is not just about education. Make sure you enjoy yourself as well, because believe me, time will fly once you're here. Ealing is a really good place to live, as there is lots to see and do. And don't forget, the metropolis of central London is only 20 minutes away by tube. Finally, the Student Union is an organisation run by students for students. So if there is anything you don't agree with, or you have any new ideas, please come along to the Union General Meetings, and don't be afraid to speak up. Or, you could give up a little of your time and stand for the Executive Committee which is made up of students who help us out with lots of interesting things. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the sabbaticals of the last two years who have worked so hard. My very special thanks goes to Winston, Martin and Peter 
and all the staff, who not only did a great job, but have been my good friends as well. Lots of luck and success for your year at Ealing. Work hard, but play hard as well. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 37. OK, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorised scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings, to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present, and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue, which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. 
Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 38 to 40. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has... That is the end of part four. Check your answers.